Welcome to our class today. This is another one of my favorite classes to teach. It's part of our Boost Your Family History Brain Power series, and the title of our class today is Thinking Skills for Family Historians. Before we get into the class, I just wanted to let you know what's coming up. So next week on March 17th, we'll do learning skills for family historians, kind of a companion to this class. And then on the 24th, I'm so excited that our basic series will begin again. This is a series that we run through pretty regularly. I would say it's maybe every 12 to 16 weeks or so, depending on holidays. And speaking of holidays, we've got an interesting thing here that usually doesn't happen. We've got Easter back to back with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints General Conference. So for March 31st and April 7th, we will actually not have class for two weeks. And then we'll pick up with the basic series on April 14th. So if you know anybody that you think, you know, maybe they've been saying to you, oh, I just, I want to get started with my family history, but I just don't know how they may find this basic series helpful, and it is super basic. So if you're experienced, you may find benefit in coming to the class to get ideas of how to teach beginners, but it's definitely a very, very basic beginning class. So please invite those that you think might be interested. We also want to invite you, like we usually do, to watch for key takeaways from class today because you might notice something that would help somebody else, but they didn't necessarily notice it. So watch for things that you think will help you in your life or in your family history, and then we'll invite you to share those in the chat at the end of the class. So I want to admit something to you that was kind of, I, I, it's partly a reason for this class. Let me say it that way. When I was younger, meaning, you know, a grade school age, so five to 12 or whatever, I thought I was stupid. I really did. And there were various reasons for that. Some people in my life reinforced that at school and different places. But then also I often found that I didn't understand things that other people seemed to understand. There's the key word seemed, seemed to understand without effort. And it actually took me a long time to realize that I wasn't stupid. And so, and I wonder how many other people go through that in various ways, that we think that we're incapable in some ways, or we just don't have the brain power that other people have. I do not believe that that's true. We're all very different. We all have different skills and strengths, but I do believe that all of us have the ability to think effectively and also to increase our skills at thinking effectively. So that's the purpose of this class today. And one reason it's so valuable is, well, thinking affects all our lives, right? We Every area of our life could be improved with better thought processes. But it's also especially relevant in family history. So often, especially when a beginner comes to family history, at least this has been my experience, Beginners come to family history and it's just a black box. You know, they hear people talk in sacrament meeting about dreams or miracles or whatever, and they go, wow, that's never happened to me. And I don't understand what people are talking about in family history classes and stuff. I guess I'm just dumb and I can't do family history. This class is an effort to combat that misconception because I believe that everybody has the ability to learn to do family history. And it'll it'll look different for different people, but I do believe that all of us have the, the God-given ability to use our minds to do important things such as family history. So that's what this class is all about. Let's look at the four sections of our class today. First, we'll briefly talk about the potential of our amazing minds. Then we'll talk about some essential habits of mind. These are things that we can just kind of make a regular part of our life as far as the way we think. 
then we'll talk about some essential reasoning skills. And the thing about this, I don't want anybody to feel put off by the word reasoning skills or the phrase reasoning skills, because honestly, I will bet you that you're already doing most of these and maybe you just haven't called them by the names that we're going to call them by today. But these skills, these five skills we're going to talk about are particularly useful in family history. And then we will wrap up by talking about ways that we can develop and enhance our thinking skills. Before we start, again, those of you who have been to many of these classes know that we uh, give a survey at the end of the class and we ask for your feedback and ways we can improve. One of the sisters who took an early version of this class gave some really helpful feedback. She said, honestly, I found the class a little bit overwhelming. And, and she said, like, I'm used to thinking coherently. In other words, she didn't come to the class thinking she was stupid. She came with a good grasp of her mental processes. And she said, still, I found the class a little overwhelming and a little complex. So I address that in two ways. So those of you who have been through this class before will notice probably two things that are a little different. One is that I have simplified it a bit. And the other is that where it can't be simplified, I think what you're seeing on the screen hopefully will help. So our other choice is to like split this into, you know, three or four classes, which isn't really reasonable with our curriculum. So we will be covering a lot. There's, there's no escaping that. But think of this as kind of a high level overview. Maybe you're looking over the dishes on a, a table at a, a party that you're attending or whatever, and there's lots of it there. So you're just looking over it, kind of getting familiar with it, and then you can dive in later. You can try what you think you'll like the most, and then maybe after you finish that, you come back for more. Same thing with the slide deck and the recording. So today, I would say, if this seems overwhelming, and it may not be, but if you're one of the people that it does seem a little bit overwhelming to, then my advice would be just think of it as a as a way to get familiar with some of these concepts and then know that you can come back and revisit them as often as you like and in whatever depth you want to do. So with that being said, let's jump into the amazing potential of our minds. As children of God, we are created in his image with the potential to become like him. And this potential includes our minds. I visited a website on the functioning of the brain, and I'll give the source to it at the bottom of this slide. But let's look at a, a few of the cool things that this website showed about the human brain. A piece of brain tissue the size of a grain of sand, that is little, contains a hundred thousand neurons and a billion synapses. And all of these are communicating with each other to help us think. The average brain generates 48.6 thoughts per minute. That's almost a thought a second for about 70,000 thoughts per day. Brain information, they've clocked this through research, can travel up to 268 miles an hour. Think about how fast those brain synapses are, are firing and the neurons and how fast that communication is going in your mind. That to me is just amazing. This is something that research has confirmed that wasn't always believed. It, scientists used to believe that the human brain had some pretty definite limitations, but research now has shown that our brains have virtually unlimited storage capacity, which actually makes sense if we're created in the image of God. And our brains can form new brain cells. This is another one. Scientists used to believe, generally speaking, this is a very high level generalization, but that our brain function and capacity and IQ were set at birth and that we really couldn't do a lot to change it. Yeah, we could add new facts to our repertoire of facts and understanding, but we couldn't really go beyond our native intelligence. Well, scientists have now discovered that our brains are actually capable of forming new brain cells and they can change and grow throughout our lives. So here is the link to that. 
of the website that I mentioned. At the end of this class, we will provide a link to this slide deck so that you'll be able to come to this page and just click this link and check that out if you're interested. So as with any worthwhile endeavor, developing our mental abilities does take effort and diligence. There are going to be twists and turns and challenges and disappointments, particularly in family history, but the rewards are worth it, and using the amazing gift of our minds can bring us joy. So with that as a backdrop, let's talk about three essential habits of mind. These habits of mind, they're, they're kind of ways of being. We can use these in every area of our lives, but they are especially useful, I think. Well, maybe I shouldn't say especially. They're useful in every area, including family history. The first one, and this is one you might have heard Elder Bednar talk about, is to cultivate intellectual humility. Intellectually, how do you know if, a, if you are, we don't want to judge others, right? I was about to say, how do you tell if someone else is humble? Well, no, that's kind of the wrong approach. But how can we look at if we ourselves are humble? Well, here are some, intellectually humble, here are some indications that we are being intellectually humble. We value truth more than our ego, our reputation, or even just convenience. We realize that we don't know everything and we're okay with that. We don't feel that we've got something to prove. We realize that we're human and it's very natural to not know everything and to be constantly learning. Yeah, humble people tend to sanity check their assumptions. They don't take them so much for granted and just say, well, I assume that, so it must be true. But instead, they kind of look for, for backup and for proof. Humble people admit when they're wrong. And wow, if I didn't do that, I, I am wrong so much. <laughs> Maybe some of you have experienced this too, but I find that I make so many mistakes. It really used to bother me when I was younger. Like I think especially when I got to college, I'm like, oh my gosh, if I'm wrong, then I'm a stupid person. No, when we make mistakes, we're human and we're still learning. And I've gained a wonderful sense of freedom from not worrying about, like when I make mistakes, it's like, well, I'm human, I made a mistake, let's see what I can learn and move on from it. So there's a wonderful freedom in being in to able to admit when we make a mistake. And then finally, we welcome correction from others because it leads us closer to the truth. So that is how we can cultivate intellectual humility as part of our lives. Habit two is to be a diligent thinker. As President Nelson said, the Lord loves effort, and this is true in our habits of thought. So when we are diligent thinkers, we choose rigorous effort over superficial or sloppy thinking. This is one of my favorite cartoons in the world, but it is copyrighted, so I cannot share it as part of this uh, recorded webinar because I don't want to violate copyright so if anybody wants to look at that on your own computer, please feel free, but I will describe it for those who are listening later to this webinar. So this is a cartoon with two professors standing in front of a chalkboard. Tells you how old the cartoon is, but it still makes such a good point. So on the ch chalkboard is this really complicated three-step equation. On the left is step one, and it's very complicated. On the right is step three, and it's equally complicated. But in the middle, step two says, and then a miracle occurs. So we've got rigorous step one, and the miracle at step two, and then rigorous at step three. And one of the professors says to the other, I think you might need a little more detail. I'm not remembering this word for word. It's something like, I think you might need to be more explicit at step two. And so this is just a funny example of how, you know, a lot of times if we're not rigorous in our thinking or if we don't take the effort to think through something all the way, we can just say, oh, well, then everything will just sort of work itself out. And the trouble is oftentimes things don't sort of work themselves out, but instead they get tangled up. Whereas if we had just persisted in making that effort, we could have avoided the problems. So rigorous effort over superficial or sloppy thinking. 
we choose truth over wishful thinking. And part of that is recognizing when we're doing wishful thinking. I'll give you an example from my own life. And I discovered this at work. So I was in the habit of telling my supervisor that I would have things done faster than I actually did. I would tell her, yes, I can have this done in two days or whatever. And then I'd get to the end and I'd go, oh, this is going to like take me another three or four days. And I finally realized that when I gave her my estimates, I was not really looking rigorously at how much the task would require, but instead I was telling her how fast I wanted it to be finished. So I was telling her my wishful thinking instead of doing the effort of finding out how quickly I really could do that task. So when we're a diligent thinker, we choose truth over wishful thinking. We value questions because questions are how we learn. We learn to find satisfaction and even joy in exercising mental effort. And we realize that like physical effort, mental effort becomes easier the more we do it. The last habit I wanted to touch on is to keep the big picture in mind. And this is so essential in family history because so often when we find a record or find a fact or find a profile in family tree, we're only seeing a little piece of the picture. And so we do need to pay attention to that big picture so that we really do understand what we're seeing. So we ask ourselves, what is the whole picture? What are the parts and how do they fit together? whether that's facts or relationships in a family. Are there inconsistencies that we might need to resolve? Are there missing pieces to that big picture that we might need to find? And are there connections that can lead us to greater understanding? With those three habits of mind, let's talk about two habits to avoid. And I've kind of already alluded to the first one. The first one is to avoid faulty assumptions or wishful thinking. An example of this in family history is what we've called in our classes earlier, the same name trap. And that is very simply believing that two people like two John Smiths are the same person pretty much just based on their name. Sometimes it's also based on a birthplace, but if it's John Smith from New York and John Smith from New York or Diego de la Vega from Mexico and another Diego de la Vega, just their name and possibly a broad location isn't enough to assume that they're the same person. As I've worked in Family Tree over the years since it rolled out in 2012, I've come to observe that the same name trap is one of the biggest problems in family tree because it leads to bad merges and bad relationships, you know, parents being joined to the wrong children and so forth. And it really all does come down to a faulty assumption. We assume they're the same because they got the same name or wishful thinking. Well, I want them to be the same because I really don't want to spend more time on this. So I'm just going to assume they're the same and merge them and be done with it but that ends up causing more problems in the long run. So we want to be sure we're, we're monitoring our assumptions and doing our best to find evidence for them instead of just going, well, I assume it, it must be true. The other habit to avoid is either or thinking or what we could call false dilemmas. So an example of that that I see a lot in family history is when people assume that we have to make family history look easier than it really is or people won't get involved. And in my experience, I found that not to be the case. We don't want to make it look hard, right? We want to make it look understandable. But I've noticed that sometimes people will take it a step farther and make it look easier than it is as a way of pulling people in. What I've found happens in that case is eventually people find out that it really wasn't that easy, that they've made a mangle on their tree. And I've heard more than one person say, I am never going to do family history again. I'm, I'm not even going to go in family tree again because obviously I can't do this because I made a mess of it. So the solution isn't to think that, well, we've got to oversimplify 
or people won't do family history. That's a false dilemma. The truth is we've got to teach in a way that makes sense, and we've got to teach line upon line that lets people start where they are and make progress. So those are two habits of mind to avoid faulty assumptions, and either or thinking. And if we will avoid those habits of mind and cultivate the other three, we're going to find a lot greater success. So let's look at five essential reasoning skills for family history. These are the five skills. And we're going to define them very simply and then look at examples. So the first one is observation. Next is inference, analysis, interpretation, and reflection. Two observations about these skills. They can be used in any order, and they often overlap. In other words, you might be using observation and analysis together, or you might be doing inference and interpretation. I often find that I'm doing reflection like with all of them. So I'll, you know, observe something and I'll think, okay, what do I need to do with this? Or what does that remind me of? Or whatever, what, uh, you know, where my mind takes me to, to just reason through this and get to the goal that I want to get to. And these skills are also used to, uh, or I should say they are used to increase our understanding especially in doing family history, and to determine what our next steps are. So now that we've found this certain thing, what are we going to do about it? So observation, what does that mean? And some of you, again, may remember Elder Bednar talked a lot about this being quick to observe. Observation really just means paying attention, or in other words, looking at relevant details, kind of getting the lay of the land, if you will. So here's an example, and I'd like to invite you guys to put your observation in the chat. So let me put, let me give this some context. I was working on Fanny Bingham, and you might remember her from one of our case studies earlier. And when I went in Family Tree, I found that someone had added an additional spouse. I believe I had known about one of them, but not the second one. So as I looked at this, I was like, well, that's interesting what's going on here? And I really just wanted to look at what I could see by just looking, you know, was, I guess my ultimate goal was, is this other marriage correct? Or are both of them correct? But let me ask you, what kinds of things do you notice on this, this screen? And let, oh, I should need to mention, normally in family tree, this guy, this, um, I don't know if he's a second husband because he doesn't have a marriage event. Marriages without events, like if there's no marriage date, it's stacked at the bottom. So if you went to this page, William would show up first, and then Henry and Fanny would show up underneath, but I had to put them side by side. So as you look at these two marriages and the kids, what do you notice? There's no right or wrong answer, but go ahead and throw into the chat some things that you might notice about this. Yeah, Elizabeth pointed out there's two guys and they both got the same last name, but the different first names. Oh, Wendy, good job. Large gap between children. We've got um, Clifford being born in 1903. Then the next birth isn't until 1911. Next one's not till 21. So that could indicate missing children. It could indicate a gap between the marriages. Ruth said these guys could be brothers, and that happens from time to time. A woman's husband will die, and she'll marry the brother. So yeah, good observation. Rosalind pointed out that the birth dates and the death dates are different, and that's an important observation because when I first got in here, I thought, is it possible that the guy's name is William Henry Hunt? and that they're the same person, and somebody just didn't realize that. Well, Rosalind pointed out, probably not, because their birth and death, death dates are totally different. And actually, the fact that he's in 71 and he's in 78 does lend credence to Ruth's theory that they could be brothers, because that's a reasonable gap for brothers. So... Bob says, what are the locations that are shown with the two men 
Oh, you're asking, Bob. I, I think you're asking there. We should look and see what the locations are. Like, what are their birth dates? Where did they live? Or excuse me, birthplaces. Where did they live? And we'd want to find this marriage. Where did they get married? Uh, Randy, good observation. Fanny would be 41 when having the second daughter. That's getting towards the end of childbearing years. So doesn't mean she couldn't have had a child at 41, but it is something we'd want to, to check on, especially given this, given this gap. Oh, and Elizabeth pointed out that William died in 1905, only two years after Clifford was born and only four years after the marriage. So bless her heart, Fanny lost her first husband not too long after the marriage. You guys this awesome observations and I am guessing that not everybody observed the same thing and so this is a good example of how we can really help each other so let me just um with some call outs summarize some of the things that we just talked about the husbands have the same surname but different first names which is unusual but not impossible different birth years and also I should add different death years no marriage date and big gaps between the children. So A plus to everybody that gave their observations for those who shared and those who didn't. Let's see, I do see one other observation. Andy says, Clifford was the only child given the mother's maiden name as his middle name. Yes, that's a great observation. I had not noticed that. So Andy, thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, inference, our next reasoning skill. Inference is simply drawing conclusions based on reasonable evidence. I did want to point out that inference is not jumping to unjustified or unsupported conclusion, such as Diego from Mexico is the same person as Diego from Mexico with no other proof. So let's look at an example. Once again, I'm going to ask for your help on this, but let me give some context. So we're looking at the John Adcock family. I know that this handwriting is a little bit hard to read, but notice that they've been married for 20 years. They've got 13 kids, but three of them have already died by the 1911 census. Well, as we look at the children, the first child, who is born about two years after the marriage, based on, you know, 20 years married and he's 18, he was born in Chilwell, Nottingham, but the rest of the kids were all born in Beeston, Nottinghamshire. So let me ask you, what can we probably infer about the birthplaces of the deceased children? Go ahead and throw it in the chat. Good, Rosalind. She said that they moved when they went from Chilwell to Beeston. Yep, moved after the first. So we don't know when these three kids were born. There's a chance that one of them was born before George, because maybe they would have been 19 if they had lived, or possibly even 20. And But we just don't know. There wouldn't probably be room for two unless they were twins. So the kids could have been born at any point. So what do you think we can infer about the possible birthplaces of the deceased children? Like where were they probably born? Yeah, Ruth says probably in Beeston. So there's a chance they were born in Chilwell. Uh, one at least could have been born in Chilwell, twins possibly, but probably most of them were born in Beeston. And so, and the reason we can infer that is because the kids are consistently born there, which indicates that after this first move, they probably didn't move around a lot. Now, could they have moved between one of the children? Of course they could. But at least this gives us a starting place. So this inference helps us know where we can start looking for those kids. And then if we looked in both Chilwell and Beeston and didn't find any kids of John and Anna Maria, 
then, then we might want to start searching surrounding areas or seeing if we could find evidence of a move or whatever that might be. But an inference gives us a really solid place for starting. And you notice we didn't just guess at this. We based the inference on the fact that the children were born in certain places and that it was pretty consistent after the move to Beeston. Okay, let's move on to the next skill, and that is analysis. And I admit freely that analysis can kind of seem overwhelming or give us a bad taste in our mouths, maybe because of research papers that we had to write when uh, we, you know, maybe didn't really know how to do analysis, and so we just think we're not capable of it. But all of us use the skill of analysis. Think of when you're buying a new dishwasher. So do you shop around? Do you compare models? Probably so. Um, when you're selecting a school for your children, if you have a choice between different schools, probably you're going to look at this, the school and the teachers and the curriculum and so forth. You're doing analysis. So analysis, we can define it as examining something methodically and in some detail. So it's similar to observation, but it's definitely more in depth. And it often involves organizing the information. So let me give you an example here. I found a bad merge or signs of a bad merge on this William Benton here, ending in DZR. He had some conflicting dates and some kids that didn't quite work out. The birth year, as you can see, is not reasonable given the christening. He could not have been born later than he was christened. So I knew that there had probably been bad merges. But if any of you have tried to undo a bad merge, you know that it is not a simple matter. So I decided to make this table and list all the people that had been merged into him so that I could compare all their facts. So I went to the change log, found the first guy, made a column for him, put the facts. Same with the second, third, fourth. And as I recall, this isn't the, all of them. I think there were like, I don't know, eight merges or, or maybe more. It's been a while since I looked at this actually. So, but he had quite a few people. So a way for me to figure out what on earth was going on was to do this analysis by putting the information in an, a logically organized table, which then enabled me to compare the different facts about this person. Oh, and by the way, that link is a real link so you can get to a template if you would like to use this type of template to analyze some merges. Okay, the second to last one we want to talk about is interpretation. And really, that just means making sense of what you have found, either through your observation or your analysis or however you found it. But you try to figure out what does this mean for me in reaching my goal of whatever it is, of undoing this bad merge or finding out what family this person belongs in, whatever it might be. So this is an example of interpretation. Let's pop back to the merge analysis. So after I had done this, I you'll notice I still, this is kind of my um, interpretation row. So I didn't yet know, I have to do more research on this guy. I didn't know if he's the same as that guy. Same for this one. But when I got to this one and looked at the facts, I noticed that the child of this, of this William Benton was christened in a totally different place from where the family lived and from the other kids. And so I thought, okay, based on that, when I, I noticed that this family didn't live in the same place, then probably this is not the same as this other guy. So that's just an example of interpreting the facts that we have found through our analysis. The last one is reflection, and that is just giving something thought or consideration. And reflection is useful all the time. It's useful throughout working on a challenge and after working on a challenge, like what can I learn from this? What could I do differently next time? So here is an example of how reflection helped me develop that merge template. What you're seeing on the screen is how I used to do a merge analysis. If this makes you dizzy just to look at, you're not alone. 
I would look at this and then I'd go, oh my goodness, that I, 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 I can't make sense of this as I scroll all over it and, and I, uh, wait, this guy is up here, now wait, how does that compare to this one? And I just thought, this is not working. I, I am just having such a hard time making sense of the information that I have gathered through my analysis. Yes, it's listed in, like, I've got the first Thomas here and the second one here and the third one here, but this is just not easy to make sense of. And then I thought to myself, I reflected, what would make this easier? And I thought, well, if I could see like information side by side, that would make it way easier. So then I came up with this te template where I would go, okay, how did the person even get into Family Tree? Were they imported from the old system? Were they created by another user? Did they come from an extracted christening record on one of their kids. For those of you who aren't familiar with extraction, it's just the name for the old indexing program. And those extracted or indexed records were in the old days often added to the, the previous systems. And they ended up in Family Tree. And where were they born? Where were they christened? And you can't see going down, but I also have, you know, where were they married? Who did they marry? Who were their kids, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this one works so much easier for me because I could say, oh, he was born in 1814, but he was supposedly born in 1799, and they don't have birth dates, so I'm going to have to do some more research there. This table just made the comparison so much easier, and it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't thought to myself, this isn't working, and how can I make it work better? So those are our five reasoning skills. Let's wrap up today by talking about ways that we can develop and enhance our thinking skills. And again, these help in every area of our lives. I found that the, these types of skills are transferable, if that makes sense. When you develop your mental skills in family history, you will find that they work for other areas of your life. But you'll also find that the reverse is true. When you develop your mental skills in other areas of life, you can apply those to family history. So let's just talk about a couple of ways that we can develop our mental skills. One is to seek the Holy Ghost. So I love this quote by Parley P. Pratt. He said, the gift of the Holy Ghost quickens all the intellectual faculties. So if we want to think more clearly, one of our first priorities should be seeking the Holy Ghost. It invigorates all the faculties of the physical and intellectual man or woman. Next thing we can do is learn more about how our mind works. I have found this fascinating. So you could take a class on a topic related to mental skills or abilities. You could read books. For example, here are some of my favorites, Mindfulness by Ellen Langer. And you can Google this, and again, we'll give you a link to the slide deck, so you'll be able to see the names of these books again. Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel, I'm guessing it's Kahneman. And also Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter C. Brown. This one is about learning, but is also very insightful about mental processes. And also, I found it's incredibly helpful to observe and reflect in writing on our own mental processes. So I love to keep a journal, and I don't share it with other people. It's personal to me. And I bear my soul in the journal, and I'll just say, you know, maybe I'll get done with a class, and I'll say, oh my goodness, I blew that class. I, I didn't explain it clearly. I wandered to, you know, I was didn't speak, whatever it might be. What can I do differently next time? And then I'll think and write about how I can improve. And I have just found writing things out to be so incredibly enlightening. And one thing I've noticed too that has been so interesting to me is that as I write, sometimes the Spirit bears witness to me that what I have written is true. And sometimes the Spirit says to me, 
no, what you have just written is not accurate. And so then I need to go back and go, okay, why is this not accurate? Have I jumped to a wrong conclusion? How can I find out the truth? Because the Spirit is telling me right now that I'm not understanding something. So observing and reflecting our mental processes in writing can be incredibly powerful. Nurture your mind. How can you do that? There are so many ways, but here are just a few. Learn a new skill in any area, like play an instrument, do artwork, whatever it might be. Learn new vocabulary words. That has been shown to increase your mental functioning. Read a book, make new friends, learn about another culture. That expands your mind like just about nothing else. Meditate. Take some time to think listen to uplifting music, and do family history. Family history is a great way of nurturing your mind. And finally, make good health a priority. Now, all of us, I think, face challenges in our health. I don't think I've talked, or I should say I rarely talk to somebody that has absolutely no health challenges whatsoever, regardless of how careful they are. It's just part of being mortal, right? But whatever our health is, we can make good health a priority. So how can we do that? We can choose healthy food as opposed to unhealthy. We can stay hydrated, drink plenty of liquids. Science shows that our bodies function better with adequate hydration. In fact, I'll tell you something funny. One of my dear friends, she noticed that she and her husband argued more when they were not hydrated. So they started kind of joking with each other. If one of them got irritable, which is a sign that our mind is maybe not working clearly, right? They would say to each other, do you need a drink? <laughs> so stay hydrated. The next one is to exercise. Exercise gets the blood flowing to the brain, improves our mental processes. And getting adequate sleep also improves our health and so and and in turn our mental processes. I have noticed that when I have insomnia, I am brain fogged. And so I know from firsthand experience, probably like many or all of you do, that adequate sleep is so important to good health and hence to good mental functioning. So by way of summary, our minds have amazing potential. Every single person who is on this call today and who is listening to this recording has an amazing mind. So I hope that none of you will feel stupid like I did when I was a child, but I hope you'll realize that you have an amazing mind and you can do amazing things, especially as you develop your thinking skills. So we can increase our success in family history as we increase our thinking skills. We can cultivate habits of intellectual humility, diligent thinking, and keeping the big picture in mind. We can also practice observation, inference, analysis, interpretation, and reflection. And finally, we can increase our mental abilities by seeking the spirits, learning about the functioning of our minds, challenging ourselves mentally, and taking care of our health. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'd love to invite everybody to share your key takeaways in the chat today so that you can uplift your fellow participants. I see that we've got one Q&A. Dana or Dana says that they love the reminder to develop and practice good habits. Thank you very much for that. And please feel free to put any other takeaways or observations in the chat. Okay, Gordon says, rather than trying to make family history look easier, like easier than it is, teach step-by-step -step procedures and emphasize that there is no, quote, quota for completing work in this lifetime. I love that, Gordon, because a lot of times people impose these quotas on themselves and they think, oh, I've got to get this much done, or here's the one, right? I've got to finish, quote unquote, my family history. And that leads to cutting corners 
putting bad data in family tree, making mistakes in relationships and so forth. So Gordon, your point is so well taken that we really don't have to rush. And I love what, again, for some reason, I'm doing Elder Bednar today. Elder Bednar said that we don't hasten the work, the Lord hastens it. So we want to hasten the work in the Lord's way, like we want to assist him in hastening his work, not hastening it according to man's wisdom. Because man's wisdom and women's wisdom just kind of doesn't work out that great a lot of times. God's wisdom is so much better. Oh, Randy says, I get my inspiration from Roots Tech Sessions of Interest. Randy, I love that. Roots Tech has a huge on-demand video library of both this year and past years. You can get classes on free classes on just about any topic. So yeah, Roots Tech is a great way to build family history skills. <music> 